So if you look at our black and white forecast, this is our May 2022 forecast. <coughs> so at that point in time, we had not completed fiscal year 22. So the difference between <coughs> the November 2022 five-year forecast and the May 2022 five-year forecast is an entire year change. So we're going to see on the new one, the one in color, the actuals of fiscal 20, 21, and 22, and then the forecast of years 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27. <coughs> now in our black and white copy that we have, which is the May 2022 five-year forecast, if we look at column 2026 fiscal year, all the way at the bottom, we can see a deficit, a negative, of 1,800,000. 1,492, so 1.8 million deficit. So the new forecast we're looking at, we have eliminated that deficit in fiscal 26, but we still have a deficit in our fifth year, which is fiscal year 2027 in color. And that's a sizable number. We're going to go through the five-year forecast and talk about all the numbers that created the five-year forecast and how we arrived at those as well. But um, for purposes of our roadmap that we have in place, um, our actuals, 20, 21, and 22, we've had surpluses. So we had a surplus in 20 on line 6.010 of 928,000. In actual fiscal 21, we had a surplus of 1.1 million on that same line 6.010. And then we had a surplus of 53,000. So we had surpluses for fiscal 22, 21, and 20 in the actual. Now, we do have deficits forecasted in 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27. However, we know that this forecast is very conservative in nature. Um, it's not aggressive as far as the estimates go. And again, it's a roadmap for us to plan accordingly on um, future endeavors that the school district's going to take as we go. Let's dive into our notes, which really um, explains the numbers and the forecast of years that we have in place. Any questions as we go? So this is just a, this is just the first time through, then this gets approved, this should be available to the public. So this is kind of the first, the draft of the project forecast. And we have the attachments on uh, the docs too, so anybody can go in and look at the attachments. So if you wanted to look at the phone, you could uh, pull that up too on board docs. So it's uh, within 4A, and that's going to be the notes attachments there. So page one. Um, it's just the overview, the introduction that we have. Page two is our table of contents. Page three assesses the nature of the forecast. Page four is our budgetary process. Page five, six, seven, and eight just talk about the different lines in the five-year forecast. <coughs> Page number nine is the embedded November 2022 five-year forecast. In case anybody loses it. I tend to lose mine, so I always like having it in my <laughs> Mine's all tick marked, though. So I have all my little tracing to everything to make sure the numbers are correct. So, um, but we have it embedded in the five-year forecast here. Uh, page 10 starts uh, the information. Now, this starts our first line in the five-year forecast, which is our general property tax line, 1.010, that we have in place. Um, there are no changes really on this page um, as opposed to the May 2022 five-year forecast because we have not completed tax year 2022. We are in November right now, so we still have a couple months left of that tax year before we can complete it and populate the new row that we're going to see uh, for the next forecast, which will be May of 2023. Um, page 11 um, talks about, at the very top, has the uh, USAS Uniform School Accounting System definition and receipt codes. Um, that work, and then we have the types of levies. So if anybody's curious on different types of levies, we have a couple of sentences uh, beneath each, which are just quick reference that talks about bond levies, or emergency levies, or uh, regular operating levies, or permanent improvement levies that we have in place. Um, at the bottom, we talk about our tax and collection year information. So our fiscal year starts 7-1 and ends 6-30, so it's a mid-year fiscal year, so it's not um, aligned with the calendar year for tax year. Um, if we go to the next page, page 12, at the very top we talk about millage, and we have two examples in place. We have a good example of revenue per one mill, and we can see it's 430000 for tax year 2021, and we can see the math, um, which is assessed value of $430 million divided by 1000 which gets us that, and we can see the 
uh, number for the tax year 2020. Uh, below that, we have an example for the annual cost to homeowners for an 8 mil levy. So if a household market value of 100000 um, is there, we show the math on how we arrive at the annual cost, which would be $280 for that 100000 market value home. Now, if it's 200000 that would be an annual cost to the homeowner of $560 in place. And we can play around with numbers if it's 150 or 250 as we go. Um, we have a couple sentences below that describe uh, market value versus assessed value, HB 920, which went into effect in 1976. Um, that credit effectively freezes all voted real property millage at the dollar amount collected the first year the millage went into effect. Um, we talk about inside versus outside millage, and we'll talk more about this as we go and actually look at the numbers. Uh, effective millage rate below. On the next page, we talk about the 20 mil floor. Real estate taxes, the billing, the accounting for property taxes, the tax reduction factors in place. Uh, next page, page 14, um, starts uh, really breaking out some numbers that we have in place. Uh, at the very top, talks about tax year 2020 and tax year 2021 effective rates. So we have our tax rate in place, but we have an effective rate. That's an adjusted rate. And we have the definition a couple pages prior that we can go back and look. Uh, in the middle and bottom talks about our actual levy collection information that we have in place. And I just want to point out the magenta highlight of $4,761,076 in the middle added with the magenta below of $4,388,044 gives us what we booked for fiscal year 2022. And that's added below in that little blue box that we see of 9,149,560. So we'll see that in the roll up as we go forward. But um, that's just kind of how it works that a fiscal year is split in half when we collect property taxes. So we can see the tax year in place, whether it's 2021 or 2020. However, we only collect one half of a fiscal year. So you have to add it between tax years in place. So that's kind of how it works with the 7-1 to 630 fiscal year uh, within a calendar year uh, tax year in place. Um, if we flip to the next page, page 15, uh, nothing uh, significantly has changed here from the May forecast. Uh, just want to point out our tax rate. So at the very top, we can see all of our levies in place. Uh, the most recent was from 2012, and that's 7.9 for the tax rate. If we add up all of our levies in place, it adds up to that green box around 35.7. So that's our tax rate here that we have for the school district. Now, if we look at the bottom half of the page, we can see our neighboring school districts and where we kind of stand out. So us and Independence are the two lowest in Cuyahoga County for tax rates. They're at 34, almost 35, we're at 35. Uh, from there, the third lowest would be Brooklyn City School District at 63. So it's, uh, right, it's uncommon to have such a low tax rate for how we perform in Cuyahoga County. Um, Mr. Evans, I know we know that independence is going on for... Yeah, they'll be out in the spring. Uh, just, we're at a meeting and Ben, now this superintendents were talking, but independence will be on with a renewal and an addition, so they're, 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 they're as well, they'll leapfrog us there for the time being. So my understanding is that if we had a change in our levies or bond issues, that tax rate would change from 35 to whatever, something. Whatever we pass. Just yeah. like you're anticipating if an independent right. passes theirs, then they're going to probably not be the lowest. Right. As long as it's a go over us. Right. As long as it's a new levy, not a renewal. Right. That, right. That's why independence has a renewal, and then they're going to add millage onto it. And I think they're also looking at a, a possible bond issue to build a new elementary building. So. <laughs> I don't, that got shot down once, so they're circling around on how they want to do that at this point. And there are very high tax rates in Cuyahoga County. If yeah. we look at Shaker Heights, mm -hmm. um, South Euclid, uh, let's see what else is up there, Fairview Park, Lakewood, Cleveland Heights, University Heights. So those are all tax rates in the 100s that are in place. And I know it's, you know, economies <coughs> of scale, we're a smaller school district compared to um, Lakewood. Uh, but still, I mean, to ever get to 100, I mean, we would have to take all of our levies and triple it in place, which is, you know, crazy to think of. Um, it, it's also, I yep. think, interesting to note that this relatively low tax rate has been in place for over 10 years. Correct. Correct. Yes? 
yeah, that's, uh, you know, that, that's uh, very um, great news to point out, um, especially with inflation, COVID, um, throughout the past 10 or so years. So it's pretty remarkable that it stayed at that pace um, that we have. Uh, in the middle, it just talks about um, tax collections, assessed value, um, collection at 100 percent, and then collection at 97, 96, and 92 percent. And I do have a highlight in yellow around the collection at 96 percent. That's 9,063,610. We're going to look at that in just a little bit, so just keep that number in mind that we have in place. Um, if we flip to page 16, this is tax year 2020 information, um, <coughs> still the same as it was in the uh, May five-year forecast. And it's just a good comparison to see. Now, sometimes these tax rates at the bottom half of the page will change, and that's because the school district's going to have a new levy in place, um, or they're going to lose one. That happened a bit ago to uh, Euclid, where they lost the levy, and their levy uh, tax rate went down. And if we go to page 17, now this is going to be uh, what populates uh, the first line of the five-year forecast. And again, we see that highlight in yellow, that 9,063,610 uh, from what I was talking about. And that goes to what we put in for the estimate. And in my sentence below, kind of in the middle, I said for class one and class two real property taxes, fiscal years 2023 through 2027, estimates the valuation to remain consistent and estimates the collection percentage at 96%. So we're estimating that everything is basically going to stay the same as it was. Valuation is not going to dramatically increase uh, for the life of this forecast. But again, that's conservative. We're hopeful it is. Um, but 96 seems pretty reasonable, especially when we look at the middle, um, where the past year's collection percentage has been. And it's been in the mid-90s, so 95 in 2017, um, 97 the past three years. But 96 seems reasonable, maybe a little bit lower, but um, right there that we have. And the other number that populates row two would be delinquent property taxes. Uh, that number has been almost 300,000 back in 2020, about 250,000 in 21, and about 230,000 in 22. And I'd put a conservative lower number, 145, just to make sure we bank that amount. Don't want to overestimate it. Um, and then those two figures add up to the 9,208,610 that we see forecasted for fiscal years 2023 through 27 in the five year forecast. All the delinquent is what we're collecting. Yes. Not right. Yeah. What's missing. Okay. Correct. Um, so if, if we're saying 97 percent is our tax rate, three percent is delinquent. Those three percent we get back. Um, you may see it all in one year. Maybe it's still delinquent for another year in place. So there's always a delinquent I think amount. About four years ago, we had a, a big. Uh, I think it just jumped off of the report. A, a, a big, uh, uh, like a repayment from delinquent taxes. <clears throat> like I don't know, maybe. It was coming out of that little mini recession, and yeah. some people got behind. But it, it, it was, it, there was a big jump, and we and that was actually a year that we collected. I think ninety seven or ninety eight. It was a good good collection year. So that's that's historically we've been high and very lucky, um, especially with COVID, and we see now inflation kind of affecting everything. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what we have in place. Um, any settlements we'll put in here in the five year forecast that we have going forward. We don't have any forecasted uh, at this period in time, but. Uh, that may change soon. Uh, if we go to the next page, page 18, this starts uh, the second row in the five-year forecast, which is 1.020. That's the tangible personal property tax uh, row. And we can see that uh, that is made up of, uh, in the middle, our public utilities. So we can see um, the electrical, the gas company, railroads that we have. Um, so those are some of the uh, ones that contribute to what populates that line for valuation. And below, we can see uh, the methods of valuation for railroads, electric companies, natural gas heating pipeline, waterworks, uh, rural electric, and water transportation companies. Um, if we go to page 19, um, this is similar information, but it's really highlighting uh, public utility personal property in the pink uh, that we have. If we go to page... Actually, if we stick on this page, page 19, uh, look in the middle, uh, column C. So this is our valuation throughout the past years, and it's dramatically increased. It's went from 46 million back in 2015 mm -hmm. to 81 million now. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, 
very much increased um, throughout the years. And the hope is it continues to increase, uh, but it could be a roller coaster. We could be at the very top and we could be on the way down. So that's also a concern. Um, but we've been lucky uh, with that for those entities that make up the valuation, which would be utilities, electric, railroad, um, gas that we have in place. Just the history of that was initially it, it was to uh, increase to soften the blow of districts that were losing TPP, the, the floor tax. Um, uh, and as I ask now, and, uh, different people in ODE, they can't give us any kind of prediction as to or how they even calculated what districts were going to get back, uh, quite honestly. Uh, but uh, we, this was one of Matt and I got real excited last year. We had a number, and then it turned out that, that <laughs> well, once the dust settled, the number from the county was not accurate. So yeah. <laughs> we thought we had, a, we had a windfall, and it was not the case. But uh, um, this, yeah, this, the, originally that, these numbers were increased uh, to help districts like ourselves and like the Bedfords and, <coughs> and so on and some of those people districts that were TPP districts that were due to lose a, a pretty fair chunk of money not to replace it not but just to soften the blow a little bit and uh, for those who may not know uh, mr. Evans is talking about a couple a while back uh, I was checking the valuations when they were just put on the website and they do it at certain times of the year and you know I try to be the first one to take a look at it and see where we're at so I clicked into it for the 2021 and it had something like 125 million. So I'm like doing jumping jacks upstairs because I know what that means. <laughs> and I kind of run down to Mr. Evans' office. I said, you know, look at what we have here. And I'm showing him the form from the county. This is the county's own form. And, you know, we're talking about it and I'm, you know, I'm ecstatic and I'm like, wow, this is like, you know, a huge windfall. This is great news. And, uh, you know, I reach out to a couple area treasurers and I'm like, have you guys seen it? Some have, some haven't. And, you know, I'm, I'm ecstatic. And then, you know, a day or so later, uh, we got a message from the county that they put the wrong number out there and they couldn't really explain it and they put a new sheet out and that new sheet had our I think it was 81 million that we have in place um, so significantly less <coughs> that uh, from what we saw so you know it was still higher so that was good news but it wasn't to the extent of what we saw and we really got no explanation of it um, but you know there have been times that you know the entities that we work with have been wrong we know that the Ohio Department of Education incorrectly calculated the new funding formula for us. We had that voicemail that came through and uh, they had, you know, made that mistake and we know the county, you know, so it, it happens, you know, it's, we're all human. So, but uh, for that short day or so, I, I was I was like, wow, this is gonna really fix us, you know, with our budget going forward. So, and, you know. It, yeah, it, yeah. So. Well, we're third in the county. We have the third highest rate in the county, Cleveland City gets the most and then Bedford uh, Bedford School District is second and yes. we were we were behind Bedford <coughs> in that category just because of the as you saw the the, the different utilities that actually go through the district mm -hmm. and uh, Bedford I know Matt called over the treasurer and he he hadn't seen it or anything about it and and the, their then superintendent uh, hadn't either and uh, then we got our our bubble burst the very next day so but I will say going <coughs> forward I'm gonna wait like five days before I announce it I'm just gonna sit and watch it I'm not doing anything I thought maybe so. let's not call them next time and see how long it goes before they figure out. <laughs> yeah. um, so if we go to uh, page 20, same information, but I'm really highlighting that pink, the public utility personal property. And we can see for tax year 21 as well as tax year 20, um, the boxes, the orange and purple around those amounts. I do want to point out all the way at the very top, uh, there is no effective millage rate. So the effective millage rate is not used for public utility personal property. It is at the full tax rate. So it doesn't scale it down at all. We get the full tax rate for uh, this collection, which is, again, to our uh, benefit. Um, if we uh, And the bottom box, uh, the pink box that we can see, again, it's the collection of fiscal year 2022, how it's split between tax years, just so everybody can see how that works. Uh, if we go to page 21, uh, this is our 2021 information. And we basically collect 100% of our public utility personal property because those entities are paying everything that's owed on time. So that's great news. Uh, as Mr. Evans is saying, we can see where we rank in the top five schools in Cuyahoga County, Cleveland, Bedford, and then there's us, and then Parma and Berea. And on page 22 has the prior year, tax year 20, and we're still third. 
And if we go to page 23, this is what makes up that line in the five-year forecast. And, um, you know, this is my conservative nature of forecasting to want to be too aggressive. Um, you know, we brought in um, for tax year 21, 2.9 million, and I have all of the approximate revenue next to the valuation. Um, so if we get to 73 million valuation from tax year 2018, we're looking to collect 2.6 million. And I think that that's a very safe amount that we can bank in the five-year forecast. There's probably some money um, out there that we're going to see in addition, maybe 300,000 per year if we're still in that 80-some million valuation or even higher. So there is money there for that line. I just get hesitant to be too aggressive in forecasting, and then you know something goes sideways, and we've kind of overextended ourselves as a public entity. Yeah. One of the concerns right now is that while it doesn't affect us in Cuyahoga County, uh, the pipeline going through the state, uh, it, it, and the, actually the pipeline is uh, has the state in court because they're they're trying to negotiate a little bit lower rate, and the fear is that. It, that might bleed over into some of the other, you know, Cloverleaf High School in Medina County, Cloverleaf School District, is uh, they're planning on building a brand new high school with pipeline money because the pipeline runs right dead through their district. So uh, districts are already beginning to spend the money that they haven't gotten yet. And 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 the uh, I think uh, what a couple months ago, Matt, the uh, the pipeline company uh, is taking the state to court. Um, because they think they're paying too much. So uh, uh, my fear, worst case scenario, is that the state takes a look at all that, all that distribution, and, and hopefully that doesn't happen. So Yeah, and that's a great example. That's a, I couldn't articulate it better. That's an example of school districts saying that, hey, there's a pipeline going through our school. We're going to collect, you know, in the future years, you know, an estimate based off of what somebody gave us, some est estimate for the valuation. And that's when the pipeline went to court and said that valuation is way too high and it became lower. So some of those schools may have planned on that higher valuation. Oh, we're going to build a field house or we're going to build tennis courts or something. And then, you know, if you don't have it in the bank and it hasn't occurred and you're too aggressive in your estimating, you can be in some trouble at that point. So, um, you know, it's just trying to be conservative in nature. Um, we do know that there's, you know, a, a healthy difference between that that's, you know, material to the five-year forecast, a sizable amount. Um, but, again, it's just, you know, trying not to overextend ourselves if anything does go sideways. And, you know, COVID uh, for the past number of years has been, um, side, you know, it's turned everything sideways as we go. Um, if we continue through, page 24 just gives the history and nothing's changed on here for uh, unrestricted state aid. So this is uh, what we get from ODE for our resident students, uh, these funds. Um, we are in the middle of the budget bill that was uh, passed in Ohio, which is HB 110, which is for fiscal year 22 and fiscal 23. After that, we don't really know what's in place for school funding. If we go to the next page, page 25, it just talks about um, you know, our student count, statement of settlements, uh, the fair school funding plan, which is in place, which is HB 110, which was just recently passed, I guess, a number of months ago, I should say now. Um, the next page, page 26, we have more definitions of what um, some of these items are. Now, the restricted ones uh, are on a different line, but I just included that because it uh, it's kind of all rolled up together, but we'll talk about that when we get to the restricted uh, section of the five-year forecast, but targeted assistance, uh, special education, supplemental targeted assistance, <coughs> temporary transitional aid, transportation, formula transition supplement. So a lot of different line items uh, that came into play for this new funding model uh, from the state that they have in place. Uh, the next page, page 27, gives a comparison between a couple of years that we have. The next page, page 28, we have our roll-up. So we have uh, what fiscal 20, 21, and 22 actuals were. And if we look at line six, that was the overpayment of 61725 that we received in that year, which we in turn have to pay back to the Ohio Department of Education. So that will be deducted from our uh, state aid for this year. So we can see the uh, estimate is 
relatively close to prior year and going forward in future years just flatlined at 500,000. Um, we're hopeful that that amount will increase and it typically does slowly, a uh, small amount, um, but we're hopeful for that. And casino tax, kind of hesitant on going too aggressive with that as it was prior year because the year before the COVID year was still pretty low. So I just wanted to see a couple years worth, maybe two of it getting back healthy, I guess you can say 50 some thousand um, and go from there. And that's what makes up our uh, unrestricted state aid that we have. Uh, the next page, page 29, talks about restricted aid. So um, this is state money that's given to us for restricted purposes. So we have to use it for um, certain areas. Uh, the next page, page 30, talks about catastrophic cost. And this gives a history of what we have collected for catastrophic cost. And uh, we talk about in the bullet points uh, more of a background of what catastrophic cost is. And that's when schools may submit reimbursement requests for costs exceeding the threshold to educate K through uh, 12 students with disabilities. So that's catastrophic cost that we have in place. Uh, and it's been over 100,000 for uh, the past number of years that we have. It was 191,000 uh, last year, fiscal 22. Um, the next page, page 31, has our roll up. And those two tiles that we see, it looks better in PDF. So if you're looking at it on your phone, that comes out clearer than when you print it. I was trying to play around with that, and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't printing as clear as you can see it. Um, we have all the roll-ups that we can see there, and the amount has increased dramatically. Um, before, it was just lines one and two, economic disadvantaged as well as career tech funding. And they were small amounts, relatively speaking, 7,000 and uh, 1,500. So those were easy to account for in restricted funding that we could earmark for certain purposes. Um, it's a bit more challenging going forward with uh, the new items, the seven new, DPIA, career tech, gifted English learners, and base cost. But we, uh, we worked together and we, we got that fulfilled. So we'll have to, we have our plan going forward for each fiscal year, so we'll be good with that. Um, you know, I was kind of nervous when the state came out with uh, new restricted funding halfway through the year, I would tell the fellow treasurers, how are you guys tackling this? Because they kind of changed the rules of the game mid-year and said, here's more restricted funding, um, figure out how to use it and account for it. Now, some schools bake in their costs and maybe they can't you know, spend all of that, which has to be spent for certain purposes. So uh, luckily we were able to uh, make it work. Um, some other schools that have a lot more restricted funding, I would be a little nervous if I was working on that for them. Um, the next page, page 32. <coughs> Uh, is the roll-up that we have for everything. And we can see the actual for fiscal 20, 21, and 22. And we can see that catastrophic <coughs> cost reimbursement and then everything going forward. And going forward, I just kind of flatlined it to as close to what we're getting this year as possible. We're a, a less uh, on the catastrophic cost. We're not as high as maybe we're going to see, but that's dependent on a lot of different factors as we go through for uh, those students with disabilities this fiscal year that will uh, take a look at and prior year. Um, continuing on, page 33, uh, we're going to talk about property tax allocation. And there are four items that make this up, and we have those definitions highlighted in green. Homestead, uh, the non-business credit, the owner-occupied credit, and the phase-out of TPP. Um, if we continue on, page 34, now this is our phase out of TPP. So we can see what our balance was that we were receiving from the state back in 2018, it was 2.5 million. 2019, it was 2.3, 2020, 2.1, 2021, 1.9, 2022, 1.7, and anticipated for fiscal 23, 1.5, and it's decreased 213,000 every year. And it looks to decrease until it's completely gone by fiscal 31. That's in place. So, um, you know, this is just something that's drastically affecting our revenue here at the school district. There is the uh, valuation increase from public utility personal property that we're speaking about um, a bit ago. But um, this is a very sizable portion of our budget. Uh, so just a number of years ago, we were collecting over two million dollars and now we're at 1.5 and a couple years from now we'll be under one million so um, you know this is very very significant for our school district here and it's one that uh, you know I am nervous about I speak to Mr. Evans about you know just the legislature taking it away from us and I know that there are approximately 60 other schools or so that receive this funding but uh, it is you know 
stressful to think about the state could maybe pass a bill that takes this away or eliminates it at some point in the future. So as opposed to, you know, freezing it for where it's at right now or, or making us, you know, to where we were a couple of years ago. So I think I look back through <clears throat> some records at, <clears throat> at our highest level. I think we that was about $3.3 million at one point in time, <clears throat> that revenue to the district. Um, if we continue, page 35 has the roll up. And um, we know what the amounts are going to be for the phase out, line four. Lines one, two, and three. So line one is homestead exemption. Um, I forecast a modest decrease for homestead. Um, and again, we have the definitions and the bold points uh, in the middle of that page. Uh, the non-business credit as well as the owner-occupied credit, I estimated to be relatively consistent with prior years, so I don't anticipate much of a change in those two numbers. Um, but Homestead is tiered down as we go through the forecast a bit. Um, and then we know the amount for the phase out. And again, that populates uh, row 1.050, the five-year forecast that we have. And as we continue, uh, the next page, we're going to talk about all of the revenues. And at the bottom, take a look at this. This is our uh, percentage yield for interest that we receive uh, for Red Tree Star and Huntington Hybrid. Look at Star Ohio, where it was back in August of 21, 0.07, and September of 22, 2.54. So when we watch the news and hear uh, the Federal Reserve, the Fed, increasing interest rates to fight inflation, uh, we're seeing how it works uh, to our advantage where we're uh, getting more interest from the bank. Now it's also um, you know, hurting people as they go out to buy homes and they have to borrow from the bank and the interest rates are skyrocketing right now or going a lot higher. But uh, to our advantage, um, they're increasing. And for the month of October, uh, it was over three and the interest that we brought in for just Star alone was 44,000. And we had about 16 million in the bank to collect on that 44,000, so pretty significant. Uh, sizable change, and I think just yesterday they increased it even more, the Fed, so um, that continues. Uh, page 37, we talk about our tuition program, and we've had for the past four years close to 200 students in the district, and our rates have been the same for those four years in place too, so that's something I know we'll look at going to the future, um, what that tuition amount would be. Uh, the bottom of the page just talks about um, our uh, court-placed uh, revenue that we would receive from approximately 20, 25 students that we have. And Mr. O'Keefe works on this for us. We pass a, an agreement yearly with Mr. O'Keefe, and he goes around and finds the court orders, and um, he assists us with that as we go. Um, the next page, page 38. This might be coming into the future. Um, the last time we saw this was 2019. So if we read the first uh, couple sentences, in every county, a certain percentage of property taxes based on a formula is set aside by state law. It is placed in a fund to cover real estate-related costs, including paying for appraisals and panels that decide taxpayer challenges to property values. Counties return leftover money after the state required reappraisals every six years and updates every three years. So we know that there was just one of those that took place the other year. So there may be some leftover money that the county, Cuyahoga County, is going to return to us. So that letter that I have a picture of came in 2019, December of 2019, um, and it was $50,000. So we might be seeing something similar to that. It's hard to gauge, but um, that would be a great uh, holiday gift. Uh, um, as we go, page 39, just the roll-up uh, that we can see, and we have our tuition and interest um, along with the employee share of insurance that we collect. Uh, you know, interest on investments is hard to predict going into the future after this year. I mean, I've seen rates super low now. I've seen them super high, so, you know, I'm starting to see everything, and it's... Uh, I'm not sure where the future is going to go on that, so it's a bit harder to predict. Um, you know, when COVID first came out, some schools had locked a lot of their cash in CDs, and they weren't allowed to break those CDs, so they had to essentially borrow from the bank for operating cash, yet they still had a ton of money, but it was just earmarked for CDs. So I've seen a lot in the past couple of years just with everything going on. It's uh, interesting. 
Um, and then uh, the roll up here populates uh, line 1.060, of the five-year forecast that we have. Um, continuing on, page 40, this is um, a small amount of revenue, uh, other financing sources, uh, nothing too significant here, so I'll continue going. Uh, page 41 starts our expenditures. So this is the um, expenditure side of the five-year forecast that we have. And this would be personnel services, line 3.010. And this page really talks about where we're at now with our collective bargaining agreements for the two unions, Chat and Chase. And those un uh, agreements run through uh, the 2024 fiscal year. So that means 2025, 26, and 27 of the five-year forecast are not tied in with any collective bargaining agreement that we have in place. Um, page 42 just talks about object codes, and we're very familiar with all the different object codes in place, the 100s. Uh, 43, this is something new. So every so often, every six or seven years, there's something called a calendar creep, and it's the mysterious, uh, dreaded 27th pay. <laughs> so we see in green how a 27th pay can fit its way into a uh, calendar year, just how the calendar works uh, you know, if you do those uh, 26 pays. So I reached out to um, our friends at the auditor's office as well as other treasurers in the area, and um, some districts in green skip a week at the beginning of the contract year, and I know a school that did that, that caused a hiccup, especially if people are on uh, uh, month, you know, checks on a consistent basis and they can't skip. Uh, while others pay the annual salary over 27 pays, for one year and then revert back to 26 pays the following year. That's the preferred method that we follow. We just take an obligation, let's say somebody's salary is 50,000, we just divide it by 27 instead of 26 and nobody skips a pay. But so, every yeah. check is just a little bit lower. Right, right. So if we divide by 27 instead of 26, it's a little bit more spread out according to that. But you're still getting paid your, your right amount. It's just that funny way that the calendar just so happens to work for that 27th pay. So I actually put it here just so everybody can see it because it's hard to talk about where does this magic 27th pay come from, but it's just the way the calendar works as you go. Let me take a look so at that's it. the actual date that it happens. Yes. June yep. 3rd. Yes. <coughs> yes. The very last day of the um, fiscal, the yes. fiscal year. Yes. Yep. Jeez. Yep. So I even sent out an email to everybody, uh, the treasurers in Cuyahoga County, and said, hey, are you guys starting to plan for it? And you know, I got some responses back. A lot of schools, though, I want to say it's over 80%, I think. Um, around 24 pays. So that could be something we look at in mm -hmm. the future. If everybody, you know, unions and everybody are in agreement where you're paid on basically the 15th and the 30th or first and 15th yeah. of the month. So you just do 24 and you never have to worry about, you know, any funny 27th pay that's out there or anything along those lines. So yeah. sounds pretty easy, but I don't know. It sounds easy, but like I told Matt, the major undertaking is the, those people that already have money coming directly out of their mm -hmm. accounts on that every other week basis. That's a you know, so ma so many people now have just direct pay from their from their checking accounts for a lot of different bills, and and that's you have to go through one by one by one to, just to make sure that you've got them all lined up on the date you want them lined up on. So, <clears throat> yeah. um, the next page, page forty four, um, just a comparison between actuals, fiscal twenty one and fiscal twenty two, and if we continue on, page forty five compares fiscal 22 actuals to fiscal 23 estimates now. And I want to point out um, what looks like maybe the largest change here, line 7. So we, in the summer of this year, hired nine intervention specialists from the ESC of Northeast Ohio. So before, we used to hire those same nine people year by year, and we used to pay for their salaries directly to the ESC through purchase services, so a 400 object code, and no longer are we doing that because we brought them on our payroll. So now we're paying those salaries through the 100 object code, so that's why we see that amount there. Um, it's roughly about $648,000, and we do have some reimbursements that go along with that. Title I and IDEA rows 8 and 9 that apply to that, uh, those salaries that we have in place. Um, lines five and six deal with uh, the three teachers that are covered by ESSER two and ESSER three, along with the grant reimbursements, and we're looking at about two hundred thousand for fiscal twenty three, as we go for that ESSER money that we have in place to cover those salaries. And as we continue, page forty six, um, we have our roll up. 
for everything. So we have certified at the top half, non-certified in the middle, and our grand total at the bottom. And again, that large increase between fiscal 22 and 23 primarily is due to bringing on the nine intervention specialists uh, that we have in place. And then we also see another significant item in the box in the very top right-hand corner is when that ESSER money is used up, which would be fiscal 25, um, you know, how we would cover the salaries of the three employees, the two teachers and the MTSS coordinator that we have in place for that. And to point out, um, on the next page, in our highlight in red, the estimated salaries for fiscal year 25 through 27 only accounts for step increases and educational incentives as those carry over from the existing negotiated contract if there's no new contract. Negotiations between both unions and the Board of Education will determine any future rate or increase, other increases to be forecasted that we have in place. So we're accounting for the step and educational incentives, but no base increase. And if we want to see the base increase from prior years, let's go back to page 41. 41. And we can see uh, for chat in sort of the middle of that page, back in the 17-18 year, 2% on the base, so BA step one. So the very first step for a bachelor's degree teacher, step one, 37,000. Uh, 2% for 1819 raise, so that took that to 38. 590, 2%, 2%, 2%. So that's where the 2%s really come in. So that's the base increase you have. So if there was no base increase uh, for 24, 25, let's say, for example, that would be 44,853, a 0% base. People still move up their steps unless they've maxed those out. So if I'm a first year teacher, I move to my second step on the salary schedule. Um, if I've been here for 10 years and there's only 10 steps, I'm capped and I, I just stay there. And well, you get your, everyone gets only if it's negotiated. We're right, but yes. in the current contract. Correct, yes. <coughs> correct, yep. And if I go from bachelor's to master's, you move over columns as well. So I could get a higher amount if I get my master's degree, for example, from a teacher. Yeah. Um, so those are okay. personnel. We went backwards. Yep, we went backwards, yep. So if we go to uh, page 48, that starts our retirement and insurance benefits. And I just wanted to point out uh, the new numbers here would be the October 1st, 2022 rates that we see. And there was a 6.7% increase for medical and drug and a 2.4 increase, but that's just for family rates. It was a 0% uh, increase for single rates for dental and a 0% increase for vision. And if we look at our history on our rates, um, we've seen... Um, our dental be lower than what it was. So our dental now, let's say in 2022, at 49.21 for single and 140.01 for family is lower than what it was in 2019 when we had medical mutual instead of Delta Dental. So that was 64.02 for single and for family it was 143.97. And we made that change during the November 18th, 2020, so almost two years ago, um, switching that up. So going to better benefits for dental and vision at a lower cost. And if we go to the next page, page 49, um, this just talks about the object codes that we code all the expenses to when we talk about our Bureau of Workers' Compensation rate. Um, our rate's been relatively consistent through the past number of years. Uh, I mean, we're always working on uh, reducing that rate even more. Uh, page 50, uh, this just compares fiscal 21 to fiscal 22 <coughs> expenditures. The next page, page 51, is our roll-up. And uh, the grand total is what populates row 3.020 on our five-year forecast. And um, on these numbers, I am more conservative um, with the increases, especially when it comes to our insurance, medical drug, dental vision. Um, I have a 12% increase in there. 
It's hard to, you know, plan on, you know, insurance costs always go up. I know of $2 million claims right now in Suburban Health Consortium that are affecting all members. Um, we did have a 6.7% increase. Um, if there's a, a bad year for the consortium, that could be even higher the following year that we have in place. Plus, we have people going from single status to family status insurance that uh, could increase that amount or just new people on the plan altogether. Um, everything else is relatively consistent um, with where we're at for our expenditures that we have in place. Um, if we continue, page 52 just talks about the methodology for those. And page 53 starts purchase services, and we see all the 400 object codes that make that up. It takes a lot of time to go through all of our expenses and put everything to the right object code. So it'd be so much easier to just lump everything in a 400, 200, 100, but you can't do that. So. Um, Page 54 talks about um, our contract with the ESC of Northeast Ohio. So before, we would see about 30 people here, but we see uh, less because those nine employees were taken off here, and now that expenditure is in payroll and no longer here that we have in place. And that occurred during the June 8th, 2022 Board of Education meeting. Um, and uh, this expenditure will be on lines 48, 49, and 50 in object code 411. Um, page 55 starts our typical general fund expenditures for 400 objects. So we look at professional and technical services, and this gives us our budget for five years' worth. So we have our budget for fiscal 24, 25, fiscal 23, current year in which we're in. Um, and these always get modified as we go out through the year. So. You know, we have to pick, you know, from one to give to another just because we have more expenditures than the other. You know, this allows us to, to do that. Um, page 56, more of those expenditures. And these are what make up those long reports that I have in um, board docs every month when we close the month. And we have all these expenditures for the current year, and we further break it out just to see. Um, we can see on lines 40, 49, and 50, uh, reduction uh, for those salaries. Now, keep in mind, too, that we also have those grants that we use, Title I and our IDEA grant. Uh, we have three teachers that we apply that to, uh, so that's why that real expenditure is less than what we see because of those uh, grants that we use for that. Um, continuing on page 57, um, you know, we can see increases to uh, certain line items that we have in place. Um, 66, we know legal. We've seen an increase in legal costs. Um, architect costs, we've seen an increase in that, 67. Um, continuing on, page 58, this talks about our repairs and maintenance. So, um, you know, if we have boilers that go down or elevators that need repairs, um, if it's just a repair, it would be a 423 um, object code out of our general fund. If we're going to completely redo it, that would be a permanent improvement out of our 003 fund that we would have in place. And we don't have any permanent improvement fund levy. Um, but we see you know, a healthy amount that we uh, budget for repairs every year because you never know what's going to break and you just want to make sure you have it in the budget. Um, but you know, those just come up you know, as you know, stuff just, uh, you know, just breaks. There we go. Um, page 59 continues that. Page 60. Um, more expenditures, 61, more expenditures, 62, utilities at the bottom of the page, um, 63. I wanted to point out the bottom half of page 63. This is our tuition uh, for outplacement primarily. And I worked with Mr. Burek on the students that we have outplaced, and we have, a, a as of this point in time, this is what this map looks like for us. Now it could change as the school year goes, um, but as of this point in time, that's what this looks like for outplacement of our students. Um, it's always going to change as we go, so just be cognizant of that. And um, some years higher, some years lower as we take a look at that. Uh, page 64 is the total, grand total, that we have, and that makes up line. 3.030, which is purchase services of the five-year forecast that we have. 
Uh, 65 starts our supplies and materials. All of our 500 object codes. Uh, and a lot of these are general supplies for the elementary school, middle school, high school. Uh, 67 continues that. 68 uh, talks about office supplies, health and hygiene supplies, the 514 object code. Uh, page 69 talks about software. Page 70 continues software. Computer supplies, we're seeing more of that in our budget. Just computers are being used more and more. Um, page 71, textbooks that we see for the elementary school, middle school, and high school. And we have 25,000 set aside for new items. We'll come across new textbook adoptions every so often, so that's what their, that money is earmarked for. Um, you know, if we don't need them, we don't spend it. It's just, you know, comes back to us in the five-year forecast. 72 uh, talks about supplemental textbooks. Um, 73 talks about library books, periodicals, um, operations, <laughs> maintenance, and repairs. So supplies, tools uh, for that that we would have, electrical supplies, plumbing, um, our salt for snow, uh, buildings and grounds equipment. Uh, 74 talks about... Uh, Water treatment chemicals, door maintenance, custodial supplies, uh, lighting supplies, lawn care, ceiling tiles. Do we need any in here? No? Everything like, well, that one maybe. It's kind of increase that. Increase that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the five eighties deal with our uh, vehicles. So line two twenty two, which is fuel. Um, I just spoke with our mechanic the other day. And he was talking about the recent news stories that we hear of diesel fuel, so a shortage on diesel fuel and how that cost could increase. So we're monitoring that. Um, I read some articles that say don't panic buy right now. Um, but if I think back to the uh, early stages of uh, the pandemic, um, it was toilet paper. Everybody was freaking out about toilet paper. So it's like, you know, what are you doing after work? I'm driving the Giant Eagle to get, you know. So. <laughs> Try not to panic buy with uh, fuel, but it is concerning to hear about diesel <coughs> fuel. That's um, so all of our buses diesel. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So that, but again, I was as I was explaining it, you know, to our is mechanic, I was saying, you know, yeah, if, if yeah, if we don't have diesel fuel, you know, everybody's going to be in the same fire. boat. Yeah. And then nobody can drive anywhere, you know, diesel fuel and. You know, his response to me is like, well, if everything's going down, I want to be the last ship going down. And I thought that was pretty funny. So, um, I said, yeah, fair enough. That was a great response. Um, the next page, page 75, um, just continues. And we have our grand total, our roll-up of everything. And that's the line that populates our supplies and materials, which is forecast line 3.040. Uh, the next one would be um, capital outlay. Uh, 76, that's a 600 object code. And we don't have too much here on 77, 78, 79. And that's a flatlined amount of 150,000 for all the years in the five year forecast. Uh, we're almost there. Page 80, uh, these are other objects. And we can see the 800 object codes that make this up. Uh, 81, not much there aside from line 11, which is our county auditor and treasurer fee. So they take a certain portion of our property taxes when we receive them. Um, 82, nothing significant there on those lines. Um, that roll up the grand total is what populates forecast line 4.3, which is other objects. Uh, continuing on, just a couple pages left, we have page 83 which is our transfers out. <clears throat> and we can see our actual transfer out for fiscal 22 was 75,000. And it's estimated to be 225,000 for the 100,000 for the athletic fund, 75,000 for the food service fund, and 50,000 for set-asides. Now, set-asides, speak about it in the middle here, uh, school districts are required by state statute um, to annually set aside an amount based on a formula for capital improvements and maintenance, amounts mm -hmm. not spent by fiscal year end or offset by other restricted resources received during the year must be held in cash at fiscal year end and carried forward to be used for the same purpose in future years. So our auditors are always looking at our set aside requirement and we have to put so much aside. We've had offsets the past number of fiscal years. So we put 382, 
499-507. And we have two different ORC sections in which we could, we have to use um, a set-aside equation. So it can be either 3315.18 or 0.19. And we use the 1.8 approach, which is less than what it would be for 0.19. And these are for capital improvements that we have. And our permanent improvement levy, as we've been uh, talking about, that would uh, more than fulfill this requirement every year that we would have if we put one or two mills in. One mill is about four hundred some thousand dollars that we would have. And I just inquired with the OFCC, and we're six oh two out of six ten on the list. Oh, we so, moved up. <laughs> so, yeah, from six oh eight or wherever we were at. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the second to last page, we talk about our advances out. So we had more advances out than I've ever done, ever as a treasurer, and that's due to all the COVID grants that we've had. Um, and all that means is if there's a fund with a deficit and we have yet to get a reimbursement from the state for uh, presentation purposes on our financials, we advance from the general fund to that grant fund to bring it up to zero and then advance back into the general fund. So we had nine, uh, we had our school bus grant, which was 180,000 that we advanced out of the general fund to that grant fund and then back in. Uh, and then we had our ESSER two, ESSER three, the American Rescue Plan IDEA, uh, Title I, um, EOEC, Title IV, the American Rescue Plan IDEA, and Title IIA, um, which totaled up to 543,555. And we see those two amounts in the five-year forecast. Before we go to the forecast, look at the very bottom in red. Advances out are repaid in the following fiscal year and will be booked as revenue on forecast line 2.050 advances in. So if we look at our forecast, the advance out, yep. So go to column 2022 first, and we're looking for line 5.020, mm -hmm. and that's our 543,000. 555, so that's what we advanced out, paid out of the general fund to those grant funds. And then once we hopped over to the new fiscal year, the fiscal 23, the money was sitting in those grant funds and we gave it back to the general fund. So then it's going to look like revenue. So we see that 543.555 in column 2023 in row 2.050 advances in. So that's how it works. You just advance out, advance in. There's no net change in it. So think of it as, you know, ten dollars. I'm gonna take ten dollars and give it to a grant fund in twenty two and then I'm gonna receive it back in twenty three. And the last page would just be our encumbrances. So purchase orders that for um, many reasons we have paid on and sit out there at the end of a fiscal year. So we may not have received the materials if we're ordering stuff towards the end of the year. If we have a couple high ticket items in place for furniture or textbooks, um, that can really, you know, we're just waiting to receive everything before we cut the check. Um, it's been in the ballpark of approximately 100,000, give or take. Always want it as small as possible, but sometimes, uh, you know, if, if more purchases are done towards the end of a fiscal year, you just have those encumbrances and you have to wait till everything comes. We know that supply chains have been affected. So, you know, it's just kind of one of those things. I would love it to be zero, but it's just that never happens. Unless we stop at purchasing it like January, then we'll make sure that we don't have to. I don't think we can get away with that. And that's the uh, five-year forecast that we have. So, you know, just overall looking at it, uh, you know, um, it's, you know, we're, we're in the middle of the pack, I would say. Some schools have, you know, all five years in the black and no deficit spending. That's maybe hard to come by. Uh, you see some, some schools that are deficit spending uh, all throughout the whole forecast, so even actual years as well as forecasted years, and they have, you know, a lot of red numbers at the bottom. Um, you know, I would say we're in the middle of the pack. We just have to be, you know, very mindful of the future and, you know, just kind of always use this as our roadmap as we go for revenues and expenses. And I know there's been discussions for the need for a levy into the future. We uh, talked about at the last board meeting a number of schools that are on the ballot and how it affects their five-year forecasts. Um, yeah, please. Any questions? Yes, sir. It's really impressive. Well, yeah. Really thorough, and yeah. even though I see some red on this page, I'm still okay. We'll see what happens. Yep. And we'll, you know, we do this twice a year, and we're constantly looking at our financials um, as we go. So, um, you know, it's going to get reevaluated, and um, 
you know, we're always talking along the way. So, you know, this roadmap gives us plenty of time to plan accordingly for the future. You know, if we saw that red number in this fiscal year, fiscal 24, then it's time to panic. But it's, we're not there. Um, we have, you know, plenty of time. But, again, there's a lot of uh, conditions that are tricky. Um, you know, our property taxes are stagnant. They don't really go up significantly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, collection rate is very, you know, we're subject to that if it goes down. Uh, with economic conditions. The state aid hasn't really come to the rescue of a lot of school districts in the state of Ohio significantly. Um, you know, we do know that our TPP phase out is uh, significant and we, we're losing 200,000 every year. Um, we've lost a lot already. We know that, you know, salaries increase with cost of living adjustments. Um, we know insurance always goes up. Um, you know, it, you know, unless there are, you know, unique factors, you know, people going off insurance or going on to others um, as a primary. But, you know, if, you, if you're in a consortium and you have a couple COVID cases, I mean, those could be significant. If we have more COVID cases, uh, that could. We know inflation could affect purchase services, supplies, materials, capital outlay. Uh, you know, to what extent uh, we haven't, we're, we're trying to quote everything to use the market to kind of fight off inflation. So try to get three quotes for a lot of what we spend to try to, you know, use that. But everything's kind of just going up. Um, so, you know, a lot of tricky factors as we see it. But, you know. But we have two weeks now to digest everything before we vote. So, you know, please feel free to reach out on any questions and, and discuss. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Yep. Your, uh, your attention to detail and accuracy are, are greatly appreciated. It's really nice to have uh, a, a strong, competent leader in the financial area. So thank you. And not only that, the explanations were so clear. So thank you very much. Yep. Uh, unless there's any further questions on the presentation, we can move on to uh, agenda item number five. Mr. Muccio again. Yep, uh, just one item tonight for uh, approval. Motion to approve the minutes of the October 19th, 2022 regular meeting as found in attachment T1. Okay, so can we, we need a motion for that, Mr. Muccio? So motion to approve uh, Mr. Muccio's consent agenda, treasurer's consent agenda item, please. So moved. Ms. Edder moves, I'll second. Any discussion, Mr. Muccio? None? Okay, let's move to the vote, uh, Mrs. Edder? Aye. Mr. Dobbins? Aye. Ms. Prowse? Aye. Mr. Suchaki? Aye. Motion passes 4-0. Um, item number six, uh, Mr. Evans. All right, <clears throat> 6A. Uh, motion to approve the tuition adjustment for a PSI em employee. Uh, B, uh, motion to adopt a revised miscellaneous. Uh, this, this is the one we pulled off. I apologize. Right? Yeah. Because the well, the uh, the attachment is not accurate. Right. The attachment should. So should be that's. It's fifteen dollar calculator. Um. It's just one change. And this attachment. It's just. Should it's just. Actually, nine. It's, it's just one system. change. Can we pass that out? Yeah. Thank you. I thought it was funny because there wasn't any yeah, amount. Yeah, the attachment for 6B should be the attachment for 9A. And all we did was which makes it the, the attachment is we, and I'll, we raised the rate on the on the lifeguards for the pool. 7A, motion to accept the resignation of Brian Voigt as Science Olympiad Advisor for the 22-23 school year. Uh, 7B, motion to accept the resignation of Christine Bennett as Ski Club Advisor for 22-23 school year. 7C, motion to accept the resignation of Julia Riley as assistant co uh, coach, girls basketball coach for 22-23 school year. And 7D, motion to accept the resignation of Chris Clements from a four and a half hour bus van driver and one and a half hour custodian three effective November 6th. Uh, employment, 8A, motion to approve the employment of Chris Clements as custodian three, step three effective no November 7th. 2022-22-23 school year. 9A, motion to approve the attached supplemental positions miscellaneous pay rate contract list is updated 11-2-22 um, for the 22-23 school year contingent upon successful completion BCI FBI background checks and proper certifications. Yes, yeah, so what do we do now? So
Nine B motion to approve the attached supplemental contract chat contract list as updated eleven two for twenty two twenty three school year contingent upon successful completion BCI FBI background checks. Nine C motion to approve Sarah King as lifeguard for twenty two twenty three school year contingent upon successful completion BCI FBI checks and proper certification if applicable. Nine D. Motion to approve the adjustment of Corey Schmidt's supplemental contract as assistant boys basketball coach from one half contract to volunteer for the 22 23 school year. 10. 10A, motion to approve emergency repair work order for Thyssen Krupp Elevator Company uh, at a cost of $19,515. B, motion to approve the eighth grade overnight field trip to Washington, D.C., March 13th to 15th per the attachment. 9C, motion to approve the model United Nations overnight trip to Columbus, Ohio, December 5th to the 7th, 2022, per the attachment. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, my mouse from dying here. Motion to approve an agreement with Summit Educational Service Center Governing Board for Literacy Resource Consultation Services for 22-23 school year at a cost of $3,085.50 to be paid with Title II grant funds per the attached documents. E, motion to approve the PSI service change for additional clinics, clinic services for new district RN to shadow current district nurse from 1018-22 to 1021-22 uh, for a total of 30 hours at a rate of 42.75. F, motion to approve. I'll pull that one, pull that one off. I'll, we'll do that one separately. I asked for those items to be approved. Okay, so you're going to have to help me out, Mr. Evans and Mr. Young. So we need a motion to approve the superintendent's consent agenda items, and I understand that to be items, everything except item, is it item 6A and 9A? Are we pulling off? 6A and 9A have their own exception. Okay, so we're going to... We'll do those, those separately. Separate. We're going to, okay, so everything except item 6A and 9A... And 10F. Uh, and 10F. And, 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 and 10F. Yeah, yeah. 6B and 9A. 6B, 9A, and 10F, those items accepting, may I have a motion to approve otherwise the superintendent's consent agenda items? Yes. So moved. Mr. Sujaki moves. I'll second. Mr. Evans, discussion? Again, I apologize for those attachments getting all mixed up there. Um, 6A, that's the, that's, we granted that to PSI employees previously. Our, our new nurse um, has custody of her grandchild in it. Students already a tuition student here in the district. This would waive the tuition, which we have, we have done for previously for PSI employees. Seven <clears throat> A. Brian Voigt stepping away from Science Olympiad. I think he's going to uh, he's taking on bowling uh, as a assistant coach. Christine Bennett stepping away from Ski Club. Uh, Julia Riley uh, has got a position at the school where she teaches at, and Chris Clements is resigning his position to take a full-time custodian's position. And jump this without moving stuff all over the place here. Uh, 8A, approved Chris Clements. Um, custodian's three for 22-23 school year. Um, this, the, this hire still leaves us one custodian short with Darius. We just had a retirement, so we've been... Uh, one of the things that Matt and I were talking about today as we were looking at the numbers, we've been we've been a custodian down uh, for well over a year and mm -hmm. still trying to fill a position. Just, you know, every now and again we get a couple applications in there. We've interviewed some people. It's just uh, not, not the right fit and not what we're looking for. Chris has been with us uh, as a bus driver and uh, uh, has worked pretty hard with us through the summer, so we're going to bring Chris on. But we, we were down, too, so we really had to do something. Um, 9A is we pulled off, correct? Yes. I have 9B. Oh, 9B. 9A, 9A is the chat ones. I'm, I apologize. Yeah. I have 6A, 9B, and 10F is mm, gave no. 6B and 9A. Yes. 6B, 9A. 9B is correct. This is okay. Corey Taylor. 6B, 9A, 10F. Thank you. <laughs> You're good. Bingo. Well, I have to say, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like we should say bingo. That's <laughs> 9B are the, the chat supplemental con, uh, positions on, for the attached document. Uh, approve the employment of lifeguard for 22-23 school year, uh, Sarah King. Uh, Sarah um, is the daughter of Joe King, who does a lot of sub-enforce in the building. 
Um, we thought we had her last year, and she had another job, but uh, she's going to help us out. And quite honestly, we have to have lifeguard and staff swim practice. One of mm -hmm. the one of the things that a lot of people don't realize that even with the swim team practicing, we have to have guards on station uh, at the same time. So um, Sarah's helping us out there. Hopefully, going to cultivate some more of our own. Nine D motion to approve the adjustment. Corey Schmidt. Corey's moving from halftime to a volunteer position. Uh, the contracts, Dyson Krupp, work order. Uh, not, this was a result of the uh, uh, power surge again. Uh, I know that we've added this to our claim as well, our insurance claim, $19,500. I'm meeting with um, the uh, uh, building code people from the village tomorrow at the elevator <clears throat> with Mr. Zabola to take a look at it. We try to get, a, we try to get additional bids, but uh, the one company we called said it's too old for us to bid on. Dyson Krupp's been the company we've been with, and they've scoured the country. It's, it's still a, a, an analog system. And the question I'm going to try to get answered tomorrow is, can we switch to digital controls in, without calling it a replacement elevator? Because mm -hmm. that elevator does not fall into the new code. New code says a gurney has to fit, not propped up, in the, in the elevator. And right now we can fit a gurney in there, but it has to be tilted. Um, so um, I don't know. We're going to try to get some kind of clarification from that tomorrow. But the, uh, primarily, you know, the, the elevator has been extremely well cared for, uh, but, but the controls are obsolete. I know that the last time that we had a control issue that they had a – stuff had to get shipped in from California for just for the, some of the controls. So um, hopeful to get some answers tomorrow. I'm meeting with Kenny LaBella and Norm Cassini from the village tomorrow and have that discussion. Um, and again, we can't make that shaft any bigger. So if it had to be a new elevator, it would have to go on the outside of the building and get attached. And we're probably talking excess of $200,000 at that point to, to build that. Like in that, those of us that remember the high school elevators, actually, that part was added on. The old doorway used to be the inside doorway. that, And then they added that whole, bumped that whole section on that and put that elevator in. It worked back there. We don't have a spot as clean as that over in the elementary building. It's just, it's just difficult. Um, the eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C., that's with no walk tours. Um, Mr. Detray has been in touch with them. Model UN, happy to, real excited to bring that back. Our, uh, Mr. Uh, Kosovich, our high school social studies teacher, did this down at Brexville. Uh, he's been practicing, I think, two teams uh, to get ready to go down to Model UN. This is something that we've had a lot of success with as a district. And when the advisor left, we, there was nobody to kind of take it on. Marty uh, is excited in his second year here to, to pick that up. Summit Educational, Matt, you want to explain that? And then the uh, E approved PSI changes. This uh, we've got a new nurse and uh, a new LPN. That uh, uh, it worked out that uh, we brought them both on at the same time. They, they did some cross training. Uh, we're actually going to flip flop the. We're going to move the the uh, the RN over to the elementary building, and then the LPN will be here. But they've both been trained in both buildings for now. So I ask for those items to be approved. Okay. So. We have a motion that's been made and seconded, and I think we carved out items 6B, 9A, and 10F Correct. from that motion. So can we move to a vote then, please? <clears throat> Mr. Suchaki? Aye. Mr. Dobbins? Aye. Ms. Prouse? Aye. Mrs. Zetter? Aye. Your motion passes 4-0. Mr. Evans, did you want to handle items Let's go through these one at a time, Eric. Right. I got my notes here. Great. So 6, 6B will be uh, adopt a miscellaneous pay rate for 22-23. Uh, 
that is that pay rate takes the lifeguard pay to fifteen dollars an hour, and I think that's the end of that you're giving. That's the only change on that sheet. So lifeguard pay has been taken to fifteen dollars an hour. So I'd ask that 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 be approved, and let's do one at a time here. So sure. Okay. So may I have a motion to approve item six B on the agenda? So moved. Mr. Suchaki moves. I'll second. Is there any further discussion? If hearing none, let's move to a vote, please. <coughs> Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Ms. Prowse. Aye. Mrs. Zetter. Aye. Motion passes 4-0. Uh, Mr. Evans. Okay, 9A motion to approve the attached supplemental position miscellaneous pay rate contract list updated 11-2. Those are the life. That's the that's the attachment that has the lifeguard positions on it. Um, there might have been one or two others, but those are all miscellaneous pay rates. So I'd ask that that be approved. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve item. No. 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 That's the attachment that was no. um, Oh, okay. So I'll make a motion to approve item 9A as described by Mr. Evans. Can I have a second, please? Second. Okay, second by Mr. Suchaki. Is there any further discussion? Would you like to have any further discussion on that? No, we're getting four okay. new lifeguards, huh? Yeah. Okay. So, may we move to a vote then, please? Mr. Dobbins? Aye. Mr. Suchaki? Aye. Ms. Browse? Aye. Mrs. Zetter? Aye. The motion passes 4 0. Mr. Evans? Okay. 10 F. Motion to approve agreement with North. I changed it and it changed back. Why did that happen? North Ridgeville? Yes. Yeah. I changed it and it changed some. Why did you refresh? I it says North Ridgeville on mine. Does it say North Ridgeville on yours? Yeah. Okay. It's North Ridgeville. City schools for rental. Uh, use of the swimming pool from November 4th, 2022, February 28th, 2023, per the attached agreement. Two years ago, North Ridgeville rented from us. Uh, their swim team uh, did, had a great relationship with them, um, brought some additional income in to the district. Uh, they tried to uh, get a little closer to home, mm -hmm. so they were supposed to um, have, sign an agreement with uh, Parma Schools to use Valley Forge. And <clears throat> um, the day before yesterday, Parma's uh, clerk called them and said, we're not going to approve the contract with you and didn't give North Virginia a reason. So the AD called uh, Ryan uh, and, and said, is there any possibility let's come back to Cuyahoga Heights? And Ryan said, well, let me talk to the superintendent. So we did. They were they were they were great guests. They took care of our facility. Uh, the added income is about a thousand dollars a week, uh, based on the charges. So about four thousand dollars a month while they while they swim here. Um, they'll actually provide their own lifeguards as well um, for that uh, coverage. So um, it was a good relationship. I talked to the superintendent. Uh, you know, Matt and I tease about this, but they're one of those. They have a huge bond issue on the combined city and school to put on, uh, to build a new village hall and a rec center, and the rec center would be attached to the school on the same property. So um, they have a huge undertaking. I teased their superintendent today that, well, you guys will pass the bond issue and have your own pool here in a couple of years, and maybe we'll be renting from you at some point in time. But, um, but no, th uh, this, is a, this is good for us, and again, it generates some additional income, so I'm going to have the board approve that. Thank you. What are the additional expenses that we get? The additional expenses? Yeah. That we really... It, the overhead doesn't change because we're still heating it, okay. um, and and our chemicals are the same, okay. and it, we're not paying lifeguards. So that really, it's it, the, it would they're using it at a time when nobody else would be in there. Uh, okay. They they practice after our team. There's not any overlap. I think last the size of their team, I, my, I think it's grown some. I think they had between 12 and 14 kids uh, before. I think they're a little bit bigger now. I think it's gained some popularity, but uh, um, we don't have to have. Uh, maintenance staff on. We already have people. We're, we're there. already here. We're until, already open. The building's okay. open until ten. Okay. They don't. Uh, to my knowledge, they don't have any meets. Uh, the the one meet they have here is against us. So it's we don't. Um. I was I was just curious that in none of the attachments does it say how much the rent is going to be. And if, you know, I don't know about you guys, but mine still has North Royalton in the one line on here, so that needs to be corrected. But um, I don't see, I see like they provided this insurance coverage waivers, right. but I don't see anything about what they're going to pay us to rent. It, there should have been, with the application for the use of the pool facility, there should be three pages with that. It was on one of the three pages because I okay. just looked at it. Yeah, I only see one So there page should on be that. three pages with that attachment. 
um, and that's by itself. So it's a, a thousand. It's 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 two hundred. It's it's a hundred dollars. It's essentially a hundred dollars an hour. So it's two hours a night. It's five days a week. A thousand dollars a week. Four thousand a month. So. So uh, with that background, let's move, or I'll make a motion to approve item 10F on this evening's agenda, which is uh, this agreement to uh, rent our pool facilities to North Richardson Schools, and that is as verbally described by Mr. Evans, and okay. principally that's to include, uh, would you say it's $100 or $200 an hour? $100 an hour for two hours, Mr. Evans? Correct. Okay, for five days a week, right. as you say, yeah. do the math then. Okay. So that would be my motion. Is there a second on that motion? I'll second that. Okay, Mr. Suchaku, second. Mm -hmm. Is there further discussion on that? No, thank you for the clarification. Sure, and we uh, will ensure that that's how we are approving this motion this evening, if, if indeed it is approved. So uh, unless there's further discussion, let's move to a vote, please. <coughs> Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Ms. Browse. Aye. Mrs. Etter. Aye. The motion passes 4-0. Thank you. Mr. Evans? I apologize for all the confusion with the attachments. The last time I went through it, I, things were in their correct place, and then they ended up not being there. Um, two things I want to uh, – It's I'd like – I'm going to send a lot of uh, um, information out from the non-publics about what area tuitions are. We need to uh, – I need to have a discussion with the board about our tuition rates. They've been the same for – they've been locked in for about four or five years. Uh, if we're talking about a levy, then we certainly need to raise tuition rates mm -hmm. to be reflective of that as well. Um, I'll, I'll collect some of that information. We're currently pre-K is 1,500, elementary is 2,500, uh, 68 is, is uh, 35, and high school is 55, 9 to, 9 to 12. Um, I'll get some people around us with what their rates are, but I would like to then meet with two board members to, to have a discussion about. In, in the past, we've done this with the Finance Committee, but we, we haven't really, the Finance Committee really kind of hasn't met, and uh, people were kind of moving in and out of that. But... Uh, um, um, once I get that information, I'll look for hopefully two of you to volunteer to sit down with me one night and maybe Mr. Muccio and talk through what the what those increases would look like. Are we still planning as we did pre before COVID those um, like open houses that we used to have? No, um, that's a great question. We had talked about that as an admin team. We'd always run that we'd run that open house in February. Now we may still do it, but it won't be focused around tuition because. We're quite honestly, we're maxed out in a lot of grades right now. Knows we're 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 not taking any more students. So the the I hate to run an open house and make people think that we we're going to take in all these kids when we're not. Okay. Um, uh, there's only openings in several grades right now. There's less in the elementary because we cap it at a lower number in the elementary. Uh, when, once they get the high middle school, we cap it at uh, about 75 per grade level because we have to account for any students that may transfer back here from a non-public school too. Uh, and then high school is a little bit that we take a few more in high school because the schedule opens itself up. And with kids going to career center and uh, it, it, we can go beyond 75 kids in a grade level. I know my uh, my first year here, the junior class had uh, about 93 kids in it. And I think about 10 of those kids were tuition kids at the time. But I, that, that those were tight quarters. I don't know that we'd ever go that high again. So okay. um, but we would still love to run an open house in the winter. Uh, you know, we had the band in, and we had the, the pool was open. We gave pizza out. We had the, uh, the, the chamber strings came in and played. Uh, the band came in and played. I think Scarlet Angels sang. I'd love to do that something for the community uh, just to get people back in the buildings, but the focus wouldn't be on, on enrollment and, and on the tuition program. I just think that with COVID and what we've gone through, people want to get back in our buildings and see what's going on in, in our buildings. And, uh, you know, we had the table set up in the cafeteria before, and a lot of a lot of community organizations got involved in that too. I mean, the, the sewer district and the park district uh, had set up tables, and I, I think that was a, a nice little break at that time of the year. That week between the the week before the Super Bowl, because there's a yeah. week where there's no football, and that that Sunday, <laughs> uh, that, that's what that was purely intentional. It was. Yeah. It, it, we did it between the, the the championship games and the Super Bowl. That was by design. The problem with that for tuition wise now is is if you if you look at the papers at all. The, the non-publics started the beginning of October offering yeah. testing and because they're each trying to leapfrog each other to, yeah. to get kids in and get kids signed up. So um, I don't know that. And we're not necessarily in competition with them, but uh, we've already been taking students on shadowing days. I We open that up to guidance that if, if we have openings in, at grade levels to 
allow students to shadow for the day, and which is what our common practice was before. Yeah. Uh, before we did it, before we ever did an open house, it was all done via shadowing. Yeah. yeah. And then we will still conduct the interviews with the principals uh, to, to, to ter in the, those grade levels that we have students open in. Yeah, I mean, I only brought it up because that would obviously play into if there's changes in tuition rates, obviously you'd want to have that in place before you had an open house. Now, you know, with that explanation, that's fine. And an open house or anything community-oriented that could ever be done, it, it, it only serves the purpose to the district of, you know, I don't want to it's kind of, kind of cliche, but it's good PR, that's all. And you hit on my motive, quite honestly. We're trying to do the, we're trying to update the tuition brochure, and I want to make sure I've got updated prices in it when we get it printed. Mm -hmm. I don't want to print a brochure and, and do a mailing and then say, oh, by the way, the, the, the prices on there are not accurate, or, mm -hmm. or, not, or send it without prices, because then not. Oh, yeah, uh, it does yeah, you know, that right. Yeah, that yeah. Was just yeah. That just creates more more questions than answers. Right. Yeah. So. What's your rough timeline for um, having this uh, meeting and evaluation? I'd love to get have something done bef before the end of November. Okay. Uh, so that I can so get because Margaret and uh, Charlene are chopping at the bit. They sent mm -hmm. them, sent me a draft yeah. of what they've got in there, and, mm -hmm. and we need to get that out. So there's okay. that's an involved project. Yeah. Them, and that's no, they, they you know that's going well. But one thing you know, Matt talked about the state finances. I sent you the on the money, and, and the state continues to be maybe more flush than it's ever been. Um, and the rainy day fund, if you remember the beginning of COVID, the, the governor didn't spend any money out of the rainy day fund at the time because he said we we're going to need it later on in COVID, and then they never touched it. So the rainy day fund, by law, is maxed out right now. Mm -hmm. they didn't spend, the state didn't spend a penny out of that. And they're still showing, I think this, this last quarter, they're still showing, again, record uh, – record receipts uh, well over well over what they anticipated even after they adjusted uh, in June or July receipts are above so the point I'm trying to make is that if they want to fund the the uh, the, the fair funding plan fully funded they have the ability to do that with the exception of a law they have in place that only lets them raise the budget a percentage each year so they, they really have the money in the coffers that they wanted to, f and, and remember that phase in for the fair funding plan was a six year phase in, and we're just through the first two years of that. So, um, and you know, Matt says that that's up in the air. It, it is up in the air, but uh, uh, Representative Cup, who I think several of you have met before, Bob Cup, Bob is term limiting out. So Bob is kind of, you know, his, uh, his fellow uh, Republicans have said, we're gonna keep your fair funding plan but we want something on the other side of this. In other words, expansion of vouchers. So the fair funding plan is going to be a bargaining chip in the budget process. So we believe it's going to stay, but we also believe that there's going to be some backlash on the other end of it. Are they going to fully fund it? I doubt it. I, they're, not going to, they're not going to repeal the law that would allow them to fully fund it, so they'll, it'll continue to phase in at the rate that they phase it in. And remember, it's a biennial budget. It's a two-year budget uh, once they get done with it. The other thing to, to remember is that with the with midterm elections, and I urge everybody to get out and vote. There's a lot of a uh, lot of issues, a lot of lot of lot of seats open. Uh, please exercise your right. Um, that any legislation not passed uh, by the end of this term immediately drops off. Mm -hmm. So as soon as the newly elected officials, uh, as, the, as soon as the people that are done or whatever, as soon as they get back, a lame duck session is is. Uh, it, the fur is going to fly, so there's going to be a lot of, lack of a better term, horse trading going on on, on bills to get things passed and get things through. So, um, you know, we saw it last time, and it hurt us a little bit. Um, we saw it with the uh, um, some of the uh, regulations that involved academic distress for schools, where they kind of ran some things through in the eleventh hour. So, um, we have a feeling what some of those things might be right now. I, I've, I've had two legislative meetings with two different groups, the first train group. In the alliance group, which are really very distinctly different groups, um, but have some common some common ground there. We had a big discussion, uh, probably forty five superintendents last week about about trying to uh, determine what what we might be able to do as we get towards the slam duck session. So, um, stay tuned. I'm going to update you Friday what the talk is about some of the current bills that are sitting, and, but but that doesn't mean anything because some of the bills that have been presented and not gone to committee or not anything, that doesn't mean that they can't get, they don't have to go to committee. They can get, they can get pushed right through. They can get added on to somebody else's bill. So, um, and we know that uh, education has been one of the, uh, there, there's probably 12 to 15 
bills related to education that are just kind of hovering around out there right now. So um, try and get a grasp on that. And how, like, is that like a, a week after the election through? Right. That's the assu- that, that, like right, right now they only have three sessions scheduled for when they return. And I can't imagine what kind of mayhem they would cause in three sessions. So I have to, <laughs> I really, I really believe that they'll extend that to, to they'll, they'll extend some sessions, but this could be one of those, you know, they're all getting ready to go home on Christmas break and they're going to stay down there until midnight until they get some things, yeah. uh, some things hashed out the way they wanted. Now, understand it, it's a really strong possibility at, at the end of this election that, that the Republicans will have a super majority. So anything they want, they're going to get through uh, based on what maybe some of the projections are right now. But there's also, and when I send you the information, you'll see there's also two or three bills that look to be the same, uh, one generated from the House, one generated from the Senate. So there's going to be some coming together with some of those and, and, and to see how they move forward as well. So, And the state board also has got some stuff hanging out there, but we think that uh, changes in the state board of education, or we think some of those things are going to fall by the wayside as well. Although we're not up. Merle Johnson's not up for re-election this time around, so our, our area, and Christina um, uh, from the Medina area, we've got two good, really good reps on the state board of education. They're, neither one of them is up this term, though, so... That's what's going on down there. So. Did, did you want to uh, discuss the uh, timing for the replacement board member? Thank you, Mr. Dobbins. There's, uh, you, you have in front of you, those are the applications that were have been completed. I think there's four. There's probably five other ones in there that have not been submitted. Uh, Tracy called each of the other five people and said, you got to make sure you get to the end. Because sometimes people don't know that they have to get to the end of it to submit it. Sometimes people don't want to submit it. They start the application and say, hey, I don't, after they do it, I, I don't want to go through with this. So there's five other ones that are started. Tracy called each of them today and said, you, you need to, if you want to be considered, it's got to go through the end. So um, we're going to go old school with this Friday. Um, you're going to get a packet delivered to you with everybody that submitted an application. Like, <laughs> Stephanie, Stephanie, you were, Stephanie, you were, you were here. You were part of that. Where, where, <laughs> that what, my, my maintenance guy would be sitting there chomping at the bit at four o'clock on Friday afternoon to, to deliver the and rain, mm-hmm. snow, or whatever, deliver It'll packets to houses. Okay, but, but uh, so, but, but I, I will send a packet with the update with what we have at, at the cutoff time on Friday uh, for you to look at over the weekend, and then it, you know I. It's strictly up to the board. I had penciled in Monday as an evening uh, to, to schedule uh, interviews and then whatever capacity you want or don't want me in, I can, I can certainly help assist with that. So Okay, so maybe we should table the actual scheduling of the meeting yeah. to the board stuff yep. uh, to allow for the uh, policies and other matters. So uh, did you have any further comments? Mr. No, I'm good. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. So item 13, um, 13A. I understand the Career Center would like the uh, respective member districts to appoint their designated uh, board member prior to their organizational meeting. So with that background, I would make a motion to appoint Mr. Suchaki for another three-year term to represent Carnegie Schools as a member of the Cuyahoga Valley Career Center Board of Education, effective January 1, 2023 through December 31, 2024. Is there a second for that? Sure. I'll second. Ms. Oh. Edder seconds? Right, thank you. Is there any discussion? Oh. We're doing that. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. I'm, you. I'm pl- happy to do it. I, things go, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time there. And uh, it's, it's a great place and, and a great group of people to work with. And I'd be privileged to uh, serve another term. Well, thank you. We've, we've, I'm speaking for myself, I appreciate what you've done this far. And the, uh, the awards, not the awards, but the uh, board of directors, the school boards, Dinner last mm-hmm. week was very nice. It was very good. Yeah, isn't that good? Yeah. yeah. I'll stop in for lunch with you. Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, right? Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, eleven thirty to one thirty, something like that. So I have Take a time. made a motion to approve Mr. Suchaki as our designated uh, board member, and we have a second, so we can move to a vote then, please. <clears throat> Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Mrs. Etter. Aye. Ms. Prouse. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. My, should I abstain on this? <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to abstain. Uh, or no, I, I think this is for an appointment to committee. You're, you're, I can do that. Okay. Yes, you absolutely I, can. <laughs> okay, so the ma- motion passes 4-0. Congratulations, <clears throat> and thank you, Mr. Suchaki. Thank you. Yes. Uh, moving on to board policies, item number 14. All right, thank you very much. We have uh, 10 policies tonight. Nine of them are revisions, and one would be a new policy for Cuyahoga Heights. 
As always, I try to give a little bit of background that NEOLA provides to us so that you know uh, why the policies are being revised. But the majority of these is just change in language because of law. Um, kind of our process is we sit down and with the current policy and how the new policy aligns with current. Um, most often we continue to stay with what current policy has and we make adjustments accordingly and then you'll just see change to language. So uh, the first two policies are kind of blended together here. It's policy 5335, which is the care of students with chronic health conditions. And then 5336 is the care of students with diabetes. We've revised 5336 a couple of times already in the last two years. Uh, but last year, the Ohio legislature passed legislation, House Bill 231, concerning the procurement of glucagon, which is a medication used by persons with diabetes. Uh, the identified policies have been revised to reflect recent changes in the area of student health care, including medication management and responding to food allergies in a school setting. Uh, just to note, we have placed our school nurses uh, responsible for administering uh, those medications. We don't train uh, our everyday staff to do that. The only exceptions would be students that we transport to off-site locations um, because of special education and their bus aides and bus drivers are specifically trained by the school nurse. So, uh, the suggested revisions are consistent with current state law and are recommended to be adopted. Uh, policy 5460.01 is diploma deferral. Mm -hmm. All right, this policy has been modified to recognize the students with a disability who are approved for social graduation and then remain in school to continue to work on their transition-related IEP goals do not need to master or complete those transition-related IEP goals before accepting their diploma and leaving school. In fact, the purpose of transition-related goals are to begin to address issues and topics that the student will be working on well after they exit services. As such, students who have completed their academic requirements may receive their diploma and exit services when the IEP team determines the student has made sufficient progress on the student's transition-related IEP goals, or the student reaches age of 22, uh, whichever comes first. So the proposed revision is consistent with current state law and is recommended to be adopted. Uh, policy 6700 is the Fair uh, Labor Standards Act, or FLSA. Uh, more than a decade ago, Congress passed a law amending Section 7 of the Fair Labor, Fair Labor Standards Act mandating that eligible employees be provided reasonable breaks in private facilities uh, for the purpose of nursing, should it be a, a new mother, uh, during the first year after the birth of their child. It is important to keep in mind that the FLSA overtime and lactation provisions only apply to certain employees in an organization, but not all of them. For public schools, typically non-teaching staff, such as bus drivers, custodians, and secretaries, are covered by FLSA. However, Professional employees like teachers, custodians, and secretaries, sorry, teachers, administrators, and IT staff are usually exempt from overtime and other FLSA provisions, including those breaks for lactation. However, school employers may elect to provide this type of benefit, which we do, uh, and we have uh, for quite a while. Therefore, the language has been added that summarizes a Board of Education's obligation to provide reasonable breaks in private facilities for FLSA eligible employees. Uh, a legal alert accompanies this change, so if you need to see a little bit more on this, there's a legal alert that's accompanied with it that I can certainly provide before you make, um, make a decision at the second reading of this, and uh, the, the changes are, are recommended for adoption. Policy 7440, Facility Security. Although we do not have metal detectors, you'll see in this policy, it does, it may mention metal detectors. Uh, but the big thing is that uh, it introduces vape pens, uh, which were not part of the policy when this was adopted the last mm -hmm. time. So it says that some NEOLA clients have expressed an interest in using metal detectors to search more than just for weapons. Uh, in particular, some school districts want to use metal detectors to alert their staff if a student is carrying a vape pen or other vaping related equipment devices. In response to these inquiries, NEOLA adopted optional revisions 
to the identified document to allow the use of metal detectors to alert school staff um, to students in possession of these unauthorized objects. So basically what this says is the vape pen falls under a non-authorized object now, and that's the biggest change for us. We don't have metal detectors in schools, but it does say that something like a vape pen is, is basically a, a banned um, object to have in the school. So you're saying that if someone were to find, detect one of these vape pens on a student, irregardless that we don't have metal detectors, it still would be... It's a violation of student conduct code. Okay. They can't be in possession of it. Okay. But this is just saying that if you had a metal detector, you could use it to, 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 to track for them. And actually, I, that, that's, this law, while it's changed now, is already antiquated because there's some districts in the county that are, that are, are trying to use vape sensors, and I'm kind of waiting to hear, we just, as we just talked, what their luck with that is because it, Mr. Young can tell you vaping is it's, it's not it's not like a kid having a cigarette in the in the stall. There's there's no scent. There's no smoke. There's no so when you know if they were relatively smart about it, it's a lot more difficult to detect. And there are some vape detectors that are are ceiling mounted. That's like Berea's using some right now. And I'm, I'm kind of waiting to hear from Tracy if they're having any luck with them or not. That's interesting. So. Yeah, my brother's a principal in Southern Ohio, and he <coughs> had luck with them for a while until the kids figured out how to. It's always a game. So policy 744403 uh, involves small, unmanned aircraft systems. It's the Matt Hartman policy. This is, yeah, the yeah. Matt Hartman <laughs> policy. This, uh, yeah, drones are the biggest things here. So um, this would be new for us. Uh, the policy has been updated to incorporate changes in federal regulations pertaining to the operation of drones at night uh, or over people in general, hovering over people. So the proposed revision to the policy adds that the new federal regulation citation uh, to the policy, that if in reviewing the policy template, a change to the current policy would be considered a revision. This, uh, this doesn't even make sense what they put here. Basically, we don't have a drone policy, so um, this allows us to either A, say that the Board of Education does not permit any drones on school property at all, or option B, that we can have them, however, that you must, it must be somebody that is an approved person. So, for example, Matt Hartman uh, has used the drone technology to take various videos of students at special occasions. Um, if you permit that, then we can do that, but we do have to follow federal regulations in doing so. So that's what that policy says. So if someone came to us and said, we want to have, um, you know, Friday night football game, video from a drone. Yeah, it's senior night. I want to fly my own drone over top of the field so I can catch my kid. Yeah. Senior well, night, they can't do that without our approval. And, first, and they also have to have it in, in Cuyahoga Heights, they also have the, the village's permission because the village has mm -hmm. the village has laws that prevent drones from being used. So Mayor Bocci has kindly lets us use ours uh, here, but they would have to. There's, there's That's kind of twofold if they want to do that. And actually it arose out of people flying drones over top of practice field to spy on people when they were practicing right. for events. So yeah. it's, it's, it's really yeah, gotten silly. Good, so there's good and bad, you know, I so. you see it as someone that would want to, you know, capture a special moment, you know, even graduation or something like that. And then, you know, what about like creepers that just want to like, yeah, that's why we, we've got our, kids we, or we, you know, we, we do our own drone footage. Matt edits it. Matt looks through it. He posts stuff on the, mm -hmm. he, on the website. That's a, that's a program. And we've used it for different things. We use it when they, with a Halloween walk, uh, we, we have really good pictures. So, uh, you know, we, we try and use it to our advantage. But, and actually, we've talked to talked to the mayor about about working with the, the village on some of the vacant properties, uh, doing some uh, drone footage for the village as they try to help some of these places reoccupy some vacant occupancies where you can show the building from up above and also show its proximity to Route 77 and, and how close they are to transportation. So, yeah. just do some cooperative work with the with the village since we have the drone and it didn't make any sense that they didn't need to own one. We didn't need to own a separate one if we could do some things together. Hmm. Let us come down right at the uh, the, uh, the the fall fest in October, right? The corn the corn fest. Corn roast, meat, you can use it to check the roof sometimes. Yeah. If you want to go up it, like, there you go. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. I mean, obviously, good good uses, but there's yeah. also possibility, and that's why it would be good that they'd have to have clearance by someone before they hover around our area. <laughs> exactly. Uh, policy 
policy 8210 is a school calendar policy. Um, the school calendar policy has been updated to include an option for districts to approve a school calendar either annually or biannually, which we choose annually. That's consistent with the current policy. Provision, uh, or the previous version of the policy included only uh, an annual approval, although many boards approve calendars every two years. All right, so you, we could do it biannually, but we do it annually. Um, Language has also been added to recognize the deadline of August 1st for school, school boards to approve a plan for the use of online lessons or blizzard bag. Now, we did not opt for the blizzard bag option uh, when the state switched to hours. So the high school has the most hours, 1,001 hours is a year of instruction. Um, not counting lunch, we have a six and a half hour learning day. If you divide that into 1,001 hours, it comes out into the low 150s, I can't, I think it's like 152 or 154. And we're in session nearly 180 days. So we by far exceed the minimum number of hours uh, that is required by law. So there's no need for blizzard bags. Um, the provisions that were put in place uh, as a result of the pandemic for online lessons, that, that provision and flexibility has expired. So there is still the need maybe for some school districts to use blizzard bags. Uh, we did not opt for the blizzard bag option um, in speaking with Mr. Evans. There are some uh, options available to joint vocational or career centers that allows them to have some flexibility, but it's not afforded to public schools. The only exceptions would be for seniors and potentially kindergarten. So for example, seniors may have a shortened uh, school year because of when graduation falls. And so there is allowance for uh, some flexibility there, but even then we're well over the minimum hours. It's really, Mr. Evans could call off a month of school <laughs> for, for calamity days, uh, and, and, and we, would, we, would, we would still be in good shape. So uh, the, I wouldn't be in good shape. No. The students would be no, in good shape. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you would be the all-time favorite the, if you weren't already. This is more of a Southern Ohio. Uh, it, it really is. We went. We would go. We went to, I went to a meeting last year, and I don't. We, I don't think that at that point we had had a snow day. And the guy sitting next to me said, "We've had 32 already." So it's, it, d different parts of the state. It gets cold. Well, and they they don't they just don't handle it. Well, I can yeah. tell you, the, I I lived in Cincinnati for a year, and I literally drove to school and was getting ready to start class. And then all of a sudden, I realized that no one was in the building, and I. I said to the custodian, "Like, where's everybody at?" He goes, "That's right, you're from Cleveland. This is a snow day in Cincinnati." Mm -hmm. And it was like, it, it's just different. They just they, yeah, they, they, they react differently. You get down to some hilly parts of the state yeah, where they so. don't they don't well, uh, treat the roads yeah, a lot. I, I grew up in south, southern and southeast Ohio, and so you have a lot of two lane roads in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, and you get more ice mm -hmm. in that part of the state. Quite honestly, you don't get a lot of snow anymore, but you get ice. Yeah. And you just don't have the capacity to cover all the, the little two-lane roads uh, that are you know, very rural. So, yeah, they, they do. They get much, many more, many more. Uh, they, and they get flood days, too, believe it or not. We're not the only ones who get flood days. When the Ohio River floods, everybody goes running for the hills. Uh, so, literally. Uh, so, anyways, this, this policy uh, doesn't have a lot of changes to it, unless the board says we are going to start adopting a biannual calendar but then you're, you're, lock, you're kind of locking yourself in for two years at a time as opposed to a year at a time. Uh, policies uh, 8320 and 8330B's involve uh, personnel files for 8320 and student records. Um, revisions to these policies reflect changes to the Secretary of State's Safe at Home program implemented by House Bill 93. Under the previous version of law, program participants were not required to provide government entities with a copy of their program authorization card. The current version of law now requires program participants to provide their program authorization card issued by the Secretary of State as proof of their enrollment in that particular uh, safe uh, at-home program. The revisions are recommended for adoption. Uh, finally, finally is policy 8600. This involves transportation. Um, transportation has undergone a major overhaul with respect to policy. Um, because of House Bill 110, which uh, contains several significant changes for school transportation, and this policy is being updated accordingly. These revisions provide additional clarification and direction for districts as the Ohio Department of Education's guidance has been issued over the past several months. And as in 2021-2022, there was a phase-in process for notification requirements. And what do they mean by that is 
we are required to notify much earlier um, of our intent to provide students transportation should they attend a non-public school. We do not provide transportation for non-public schools because of our small size, limited fleet, limited number of employees. Instead, we opt for the in lieu of transportation option, which you adopt annually. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to adopt that sooner than August. It's going to have to be done much earlier in the year. And the cost of in lieu of transportation is going up significantly. I don't know what that number is, but it, it's... Five, something, 30, <coughs> 535 or 5, 5, 530, more than doubled. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. more than doubled. And again, that's it's not uncommon to see legislation that's uh, almost penalizing uh, public schools. Mm -hmm. um, so for... So for children who go to private schools, like St. Ed's or St. Ignatius, uh, so, this is we will we pay for their parents to drive them to school, and, and those notifications were much much earlier. Here, in, here's in a sobering timeline. fact for you: so the payment in lieu is almost the amount that the state gives us on a per pupil for the funding formula. Yeah. it's within about forty dollars. Hmm. And we're paying the families, or we pay the we pay the fam families, families, the family. Yeah, yeah. So now everything is in full effect now that we're into the 22-23 school year, and this policy uh, reflects all the current law with respect to changes to transportation. So uh, it's recommended to be adopted uh, for accurate policies. If there's any additional information or if you'd like the, the uh, manuscript of what I just read, I can certainly provide that to you at any time over the course of the next month or anybody else that asks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Appreciate it. Uh, item 15, board committee reports, comments. Uh, I guess what I'd like to do is just poll the board members to see what uh, their availability is next week for at least one special meeting, depending on number of candidates. Uh, any thoughts as to how you'd like to proceed? Mr. Evans had, uh, had suggested uh, perhaps next Monday evening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that might be too early. Do we need 48 hours? Well, that's where we need to coordinate with Mr. Muccio, who would need to publish notice. Uh, if we were going to do something next Monday evening, when would the latest that would have to be published, do you recall? Um, I think it's 48 hours, so I think we can post it. I mean, I can post it tomorrow, Thursday, if I can get that done Thursday. So okay. if you, if but we have to invite... What? We also need to coordinate with the individuals and right. kind of close that process out and then move to the next step, which is notifying people and asking, assuming asking them to be able to come in for a, I presume for an interview. Right, so that's that's what I'm trying to get at. So our first meeting is we'll sit down, go over the mm -hmm. applicants that we have mm -hmm. and make a decision on who we want to talk to. Mm -hmm. And then we'd have a second meeting after that. Is that what you're thinking? I'm, I'm open to ideas, I'll put it that way. Because yeah. the last time when we, I went through this, I was kind of in the periphery, I wasn't uh, in leadership, and you've got more experience than I do in this. So I'm, I'm open to how we did this in the past to make it easiest on everyone involved. They were evening meetings. They were. Right. right. Yeah. And we had interviews, but I didn't recall that we had initially done a, a, a kind of a screening of, of, of applications. Either that or we, we, could, we might have interviewed everyone. I don't remember. I, I, I think we did. We did. We did. Quite we honestly, interviewed I think we everybody. I think okay. anybody that applied. And I know we did. Okay. Oh, okay. I, 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 so one candidate if sticks that's the case, out. I, don't, I think Monday off might be awfully soon. We don't. When's the deadline for that they have to have the application in? Friday. Friday. Friday, Friday. Friday at 4. Yeah. Right. I I will only say that Thursday is probably a day not, in my case, don't, because sure. I'm having that procedure. Of course. Yeah, of and course. I don't and know how I'll be this. at 6 or 7 o'clock at night. Yeah. yeah. No, that's why I asked this. And even if Friday, well, I'm not suggesting Friday, but, but so uh, maybe we could uh, pencil in, say, next Tuesday and Wednesday. And if we, I, I don't know how many applications we're going to get, but I assume that we want to budget a certain amount of time for each person yes, have to have an interview and yeah. that necessarily if you're talking if you're talking 10 I'm just saying 10 people if you have 10 applicants uh, 15 minutes a piece that's 150 yeah. minutes that's, 15, uh, 20 that's minutes, that, yeah. plus there's no time for really deliberation for the board then so you almost need two evenings of of interview slash uh, conversations right yeah. what's, what, what's, what's the our, rest of the group think what's our 30-day mark what's like our we have to have some anyway the 21st, 19th is it of the 19th or the 21st or so i think we have time but then we do have a capital conference that is in between that right right, right. 
So do we, if we want to narrow it down, does it have to be a group decision, or can we appoint some people to say you you guys narrow it down and decide who to invite? I don't know. I think it's free form. I think we could decide to to appoint a committee, so to speak, to do just that if we choose to. Uh, or it could be the, the four of us. I'm, I'm, whatever the group Thank wants to do, I'm open to. It. Just remind reminder, Tuesday's an election day. Oh, so. oh, that's right. Tuesday's yeah. election day, so I, oh, I, I, I don't know. Up pretty quickly here. Uh, yeah. People may or may not be available. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, I wouldn't uh, expect anybody to come in on election day. No, so, well, Wednesday's the, the night to be normal. The, election's over, the yeah. election of voting is over at 7.30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you're after work and then you're running to the voting, yeah. Yeah. and then that's, you're running no, So yeah. do we want to just pencil in, say, next Wednesday evening mm -hmm. as, as a meeting? Well, again, unless we want to assign two people to do this, we could meet the four of us and, and go... And, and well, I guess if we're going to do interviews. We need to uh, get to it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it feels like Yeah, I, I guess I'm beginning to and understand. And I don't need the to concern. say this no. either, but Friday is Veterans Day. And yeah, that, okay. I don't know if that creates a conflict. Is, so. it, is school in session on the 11th? Uh, not the elementary. This is middle school, high school. Middle school, high school, elementary is not. It's records day. Okay. So you guys are here anyway, mostly. It's just difficult to do meetings on Friday nights. So yes, I do agree with that. That's, that's the, my only concern about Friday. I'd rather go to the election night. Really, me too. So the night, so the nineteenth of the month, which I think is the thirtieth day, is a Saturday. So that means we would probably need to have something concluded by the eighteenth, Friday the eighteenth, which basically means Thursday the seventeenth. We've got Capital Conference Thursday, Sunday, the 13th through the 15th. So we have school of, board on the 16th. That yeah. kind of leaves yeah. the 9th. What? What's and 10th. Why? Yeah. Why well, no, don't 10th, you do eighth? You. What about the eighth and the ninth? We just said the eighth is election. The eighth is I election. I know, day. but is that? Is well, that, we. Could, I mean, we. we can do whatever we want. Well, I'm so saying to speak, there's. It's going to have to be two days. I, and, I think. Right, and so you would pose it to the people who are applying. Perhaps they can do one, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe their Tuesday is available, their mm -hmm. evening would be available. Yeah. And then if we give them the option, mm -hmm. Tuesday or Wednesday. I realize it is about election day. She makes a good point, but I yeah, feel the, like we have to try to. The following get week it done. really is, is we're somewhat hamstrung because we're going to be, yeah. we're gonna be, we're gonna be away. Then there's a board meeting, and then that's Thursday, and then. As I see it Friday by the calendar is the last day to act. Right. And we, we said we don't want to meet on a Friday. Yeah. So, so the Saturday is the 12th. Yeah, I mean, if you started in, in the morning, if you start oh, early you in the morning, early. if you started at like 8, you could be done by noon. I'd virtually do almost everybody and that's do it true. all at one time. There's a thought. Do it on a Saturday? And no. Saturday the 12th? I don't. So what's the group thinking about that? And we would I'm obviously have that. to have some place here in the school to do yeah. it. Right? Use my office. That's the church. Okay. So I'm, I'm open to that. If, if the group wants to do that all in mass, uh, that would allow time for all the applications to, to come in, be processed, be reviewed, kind of develop some preliminary thoughts, and then and then schedule interviews. But do you want to have two separate days? I'm, this is uh, the group's decision. I don't see the week of the 13th as being helpful to us. It's just too full. So it, it's something that it's we need get to, done next we week. need to, we yeah. need to uh, be able to uh, conclude the process, I think, next week. And Monday's too soon. We're thinking, yeah. yes, probably. Uh, so that's Tuesday or Wednesday, and, and Thursday you're not available, and Friday we're thinking it's not good. So it's either Tuesday, Wednesday, or Saturday morning. What's the group think? I'd probably rather do Tuesday, Wednesday. That'd be you Tuesday evening? Or both. Both. That's what I think. We have to, yeah. Yeah, I think until we know how many people are going to be applying, we have to yep. assume it's going to be two nights. So Tuesday, Wednesday, the eighth and ninth, and um, do you want us to try and start at six? Or, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to start at six, and depending on the number of applications, we'll. Um, what did we do? Was like it 15, 20 minutes? Was it 15 Like minutes? a 15 or 20 minute 15 interview 20 and then have like, so like 10 minutes, minutes to discuss. To yeah, so, so it kind of, minutes person. Yeah. yeah, 15 for interview. So that's what we'll find on that. Okay. And so this is assuming we're going to interview everybody. Yes. We do not have time then to 
as a group. For everyone that, that submits a, a, an a application, yeah. if the people that, that have been notified that they need to do something to, to, to finalize their interview but, but fail to do so in spite of being told, I'm, I'm not sure that we need to follow through. That may not actually be a formal application. But for those that have actually filed and gone the extra, the full distance and filed full complete applications, mm -hmm. we should interview the, the individuals, right. I think. Yeah. So until we know how many that's going to be, we probably should plan on two nights, next Tuesday and Wednesday night, mm -hmm. start at 6, and 15-minute interviews, 15, 10, 15 minutes of delivery, next person. And you probably need about, we should probably plan about a, the first half hour to sit down and mm -hmm. say, okay, here's the list of questions we're going to use. Right. The order them because that's typically what we, we do is we make up a list of questions, then we each take turns answering. And I'm searching for asking. some previous questions, but I don't know that Sandy had them in her files, quite honestly, because I don't yeah, know. I that, might I have it. I just haven't looked yet. I, I I know I don't have anything, and the only if Sandy had it, it got it, it got it carried over to Tracy, and and uh, Tracy started looking today to, uh, to see if there's anything. A lot of cleaning happened in between uh, those two. Yes. Sir. Well. Okay, so then we're. I, should have this. I think what I'm hearing the group say is that we're in agreement that next Tuesday and Wednesday evenings, uh, depending on number of applicants, if, if, if it's something less than, if it's five or less, we can probably do it in one evening. You've got four that are completed right there. There's five more in there that are not submitted yet. So, okay, so basically say ten. So uh, five each evening. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be two long evenings, but we'll start at six and we'll go from there. So, Mr. Mucho, you can notice that. Thank you. And we'll meet in Mr. Evans' office? Yes. Good? Yeah, that's the best okay. Place to do it. Very good. All right. Is there any further discussion of this by the board members? Well, once we've got this done, I'll, we'll make the calls from my office and schedule them in the time slots. I'll do a Google okay. doc and then I'll share with everybody who's Perfect. in what time slot. Good. And I'll allow you time in the beginning and then time at the end for deliberation. Yes. Uh, and, uh, um, and then I'll, we'll also receive instructions to enter the outer office and have a seat. Uh, and, and wait in the outer office, uh, Tracy's office out there. Right. Uh, so we'll have we'll have water, and we'll, we'll take care of all the prep stuff for you folks. Great, I appreciate that. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that background, are there any future agenda items? Um, I just noted that we're going to be attending the capital conference the week after, which will consume some time. Um, there's no other agenda items, and we can move to. Agenda information, 17A, it should be noted that the Board of Education members received their agenda several days prior to the actual meeting, thus they have had considerable opportunity to study and ask questions, etc. Upcoming board meetings, item 17B, board meetings, uh, November 16th, 2022, a regular meeting at 7 p.m., December 7th, 2022, a work session at 6 p.m., and we've just previously talked about scheduling special meetings next week, Tuesday and Wednesday evenings at, to start at 6 with that background, I'm going to move to agenda item 18, which is a motion. I hereby move that the board adjourn to executive session pursuant to ORC section 121.22G1 for the purpose of considering the evaluation of employment and or compensation of employees and or officials of the school district. May I have a second? Second. second. Nope. Mrs. Zetter seconds. Uh, let's move to a vote, please. Mr. Dobbins. Aye. Mrs. Zetter. Aye. Ms. Prowse. Aye. Mr. Suchaki. Aye. Motion passes 4-0, it is 8 or 9 p.m. We are in executive session and no action will be taken afterwards. Thank you.